So would you um, just introduce yourself? Um, I am the friend of Peter Linneman. Oh, that's a short answer. <laughs> so as a little background, just almost 11 years ago, uh, shortly after Larry Ford uh, passed away, um, Lucille and I, Lucille Ford and I decided to do a video, a long video on her life, that the time she lived in, her views of life, etc. This is, um, we're now May, I think it is 17th, um, 2017, to about 11 years later. And we thought it would be good to update your life, your views of life, what's happened to you, what's happened to the used, those around you. So let me start out with a very broad question. How is life different without Larry than it was with Larry? You have fundamentals, Peter. Uh, life without him uh, put you in a different category for yourself and others. So that uh, tends to mean that um, your pathway, uh, the living, that you then take part in needs to shift. And that shift can be easy or it can be difficult. And I would say I was kind of in the middle of the road. Not too difficult and not too hard, but definitely a road. And um, let me ask you a related question. Um, as you know, we have some mutual acquaintances and friends who are of similar age, and as they've gone through the last decade of their life, even though they're sound body, sound mind, they find themselves in a funny way marginalized because no one turns to someone 90 or 95 in your case saying start a new venture for us and carry us the next 15 years. So could you speak about, I, I will call it marginalization, it, maybe that's a wrong phraseology. But. No, I understand entirely what you're asking. Uh, I don't know that if it's marginalizing, it's reclassifying. So that, for me, uh, for others, that they may consider it marginalizing. I considered playing a, took me a while to learn this though, in the 10 year period, that you change roles. And as you change roles, you are a different um, fit in the complex of the society. And uh, then it's up to you to find out how you're going to handle this different road. So let's talk about changing your role. Um, when we sat here a decade ago, or 11 years ago, you were the grandmother of two fairly young teenagers. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the situation of those grandchildren, Christina and Sean, today, and your reactions to where they're at. Yes, very good question, because you picked a dramatic age for them, in my opinion. Uh, while they uh, were in school, both as an undergraduate and then even in graduate. Both of them happen to have master's degrees. And uh, so as I look at them, they were um, dependent, dependent in their um, final decisions, dependent in some choices, not all, of course, of course. But now, in this period when we jump to 2017, they are both individuals in their own right, with their own occupations, their professions, their own uh, decision making. And so it's like night and day. And what makes you, I'll take them each in turn, what are you proudest of of Christina as she's gone through the last 10 years or so of her life? Well, you asked for one and I will take her first, but I think the both two are almost identical in that in the last 10 years, they're very close in age, as you know, that they have moved from being a student to being a professional hired individual with a job in front of them that must meet the uh, criteria of 2017. So they got there. Both yeah. Sean and Christina got yes. there, which both must of be, them got there. Must be very, very <laughs> both of them must got make there. you very proud. And while we're talking about family, um, your daughters, Jody and Karen, are each 10 or 11 years older yes. today than when we last spoke. Um, any insights on their evolution over those 10 or 11 years? Yes, I am um, fascinated with this because I consider um, 
uh, like your own age in the 60s or the early 60s or mid 60s that um, uh, both of them begin to look for changes in focus uh, have gone through some one Karen has of course having left the Navy and bidding at Ashley University for a while and then a third step but um, they are in a transition and I would not have guessed it but they are yeah. it happens it happens um, speaking <laughs> of transitions one of the most remarkable transitions in your life that I've witnessed in the last decade is after years of frustrating Larry by not being interested in football, you became a regular big time football attender. Oh, attendee. never missed a game. Why don't you give us a little background on that experience and a couple of highlights? Well, that's fun. In fact, uh, uh, you, Peter, played a major part in that in that you made the comfort level of uh, good seats, to be very honest. But the reason I became a football fan, and it's a fascinating sport, by the way, uh, as we all know. I just heard but, Larry uh, roll over in his grave when yeah, he said that. Yeah, he, he, that's <laughs> correct. Because he loved to sit in the football, and I thought it was uh, a little bit uh, slow. Uh, basketball was a little faster and so on. But to make a long story short, um, Sean is a, a musician in his own right and is now uh, with his master's in uh, music education and employed in that uh, so that he was in the Ohio State University marching band for five years and uh, a graduate assistant for a couple of years so that in order to um, see this performance I needed to be at the football game so I was at all the football games the halftime shows including bowl games and cold games yes and and thanks to you Let's do give credit, please, if I may, to Peter's knowing uh, individuals to arrange wonderful uh, visibility for these games, both uh, national competitions and local, in that meeting in Columbus. The, the, the highlights probably being great seats at the yes. Michigan, Ohio State, yes. the football experience where you attended All nine, the games. 900 Ohio State football games in five years. The, Highlight for me was uh, getting your Orange Bowl seats in the owner's suite and calling you and saying, what kind of seats do you have? Right on the 50-yard line with the vision. Uh, I'm fearful of putting this into print, but just call Peter Lineman if you care for good tickets. <laughs> they were good tickets, I'm told. Okay, let's go to a couple of other transitions. At the time we spoke, uh, let's call it a decade ago, you were um, very active on the Ashland University Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. um, are you still on the board and, and, and how has that experience evolved? Uh, right. I spent uh, 15 years on the Board of Trustees as an active member. I chose to go to Emeritus, which the university provides uh, the opportunity to attend all uh, board meetings and uh, this I have done. I felt they could add uh, younger people, which they have, of course. But I've enjoyed maintaining my um, membership as an emeritus because it keeps me up to date on everything going on. And also, at the time we last spoke, you were the director of the Ashland County Community Foundation. Well, I was actually the president. The president, because the, yes. That's the, the board and made it that. Yes, I was. And now, uh, that lasted until about the end of 2012, uh, roughly. Uh, once I had the opportunity to work with one of our board members who became Jim Cutright, who became our director. And um, I'm happy to see the foundation continuing to go and uh, serve the community. Uh, it was a opportunity for people to respond to their own charitable desires in the way they chose to and that's good for the county. Let me go to um, a broader experience. Um, as we sit here, as we sat there a decade ago, mm -hmm. did you ever dream that you would still be alive to see an African-American president of the United States? Uh, no, not, uh, that did not enter my mind. However, the globalization 
of our world uh, leads us to um, expect changes in the dynamics of our composition of society. That's pretty amazing that it occurred. It is amazing. Um, let me also pick up just a couple of fun experiences, then we'll come back to some other questions on life. Oh, I must request that I speak about our trip to the Antarctica. Okay, why and don't may you start I do with that? that? And the you reason might... I want to do that is because uh, it was such a fun trip to begin with. Uh, uh, Peter had said, uh, where have you not been that you'd like to go? And it was the Antarctica. So as we went and he said, I'd like to go also, so away we went. And um, this was a small ship that gave us the opportunity to get into the inlets and see the magnificent uh, colors, creations in, in, uh, in ice, of course. But to come up and have the penguins come up and look at you and say, well, what are you doing here, dear? And uh, I say, well, is this your country? Yes, this is my country. My point is that the animals were completely uh, comfortable with the humans. They were used to responding. And so uh, there was only one occasion that was particularly interesting relative to a fun time. And then when you go through the particular crossroads of the currents, of the, then you hit huge waves that cause all kinds of distortion in the comfort of the passengers. Well, we were sitting at uh, the table one night for dinner and all the dishes went onto the floor because of the waves and then everybody just picks it up and going. But you see, we had a rough night and of course with our two cabins, uh, uh, Peter thought, well, I'm, this is not very comfortable and I understood that he slept on the floor. And so the next morning he came uh, to knock on my door and uh, my goodness, I had a beautiful night's sleep and he thought maybe I had left the earth with the dramatic storm. Uh, it was he who left the earth it on the was, dramatic storm, but I it was, was fun. I was thrown out of bed twice. You were thrown out we of bed. We had 40-foot waves for there. about 14 hours in the Drake Passage, and I was afraid you were dead, but you were fine. I was not only fine, I didn't even know what he was talking you, about. <laughs> you did great. Um, let me get, while we're talking about travel, in the last decade, I'm just gonna reel off some places that I'm aware you've been. Mm -hmm. You've traveled extensively by auto, I think mostly with Karen, through the eastern mm -hmm. part of the United States. You've been to Greenbrier, you've uh, been to Philadelphia, you've been to New York, you've been to uh, 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 an estate house in Southampton on the beach mm -hmm. in New York, you've been to Spain, you've been to Scandinavia, Argentina, Germany, Iceland, India, Kenya, and those are the only ones I can think of. That's a lifetime of travel for most people. That's only been in the last 10 years. Um, was it difficult? Was it enjoyable? Uh, and a couple of thoughts as yeah. you do. Uh, fascinating. Uh, I had the experience, and of course, uh, uh, much of that travel was with Peter as far as Africa's concerned, Europe, um, of course, uh, the experience in the Antarctica and in Iceland and, and so it goes. Um, uh, you of course travel across the world on a regular basis. Uh, I have had the opportunity to be to all continents uh, of the uh, world, which was uh, a tremendous learning experience as well as a delightful travel. Uh, I encourage uh, travel today. I don't feel quite as comfortable traveling uh, not just physically, but um, emotionally in the receptivity of the uh, world around us as to our own visitations. And you mention Africa, as you know, Kenya has a particular role in my life that you Very got particular. to see. Would you comment on what you experienced in Kenya when we went? I think you were 90 at the time, and you promise you're going to go back when you're 100, so I have yes, five I years to that. wait. <laughs> but well, That's any true. reactions you well, had on what you experienced? And of course, um, it, it gives me the opportunity to uh, add an accolade to you, Peter, because he has uh, chosen to fund a school for the uh, natives of Kenya who are frankly disadvantaged and haven't had the opportunity for education. And so it was my privilege to travel with him uh, to that area. And I had the delightful experience of being with these students in this setting, and he was in another meeting. 
And so I had the privilege of meeting each one of this class individually. So when he had then returned to address the uh, body, he uh, suggested that I come up and uh, speak to them. And, and uh, I had already introduced myself and it was a fascinating experience because all I had to tell them was, you can do it too. And they knew what I was talking about. Uh, they're, they're pretty amazing kids who I got. Amazing I, kids. I mentioned to several of the kids that I was coming out to visit you. Oh. And I got about six emails today saying to say hello to, the, to <laughs> you from them. Um, another unusual experience, I know you've done about three or four times. You met Sam Zell. He was yes. one of the speakers in the lecture series probably around the time we did the, the original tapes. And you might describe your experience at a Sam Zell party. To, ex to try to describe the kind of party that Sam Zell holds is um, almost impossible because each opportunity is a unique, created um, venture, wherever and whatever it is with um, all kinds of um, intriguing activities, with um, entertainment, uh, with food, of course, but it has a certain, um, I don't like the word glamour, it has a certain um, enticement to uh, entertainment and to socialization. It reminds you that socialization is one of the most fundamental things people need to do in this country, and Sam Zell does it to the highest level. <laughs> I would agree. Uh, you speak of entertainment. One of the things you've experienced in the last decade, mostly with me, but also with Karen, I think a bit, in addition to your symphonies, which you love, yes. you've, I think, seen Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, Mark Knopfler, Fleetwood Mac, Elton John, <laughs> Rod Stewart, The Eagles, and James Taylor that I can think of. Um, Plus have you become Cleveland a rock Symphony. and roll fan as a result of this? <laughs> and do you understand the appeal of rock and roll any differently after those experiences? Oh my goodness, yes. I used to think rock and roll was over here outside someplace. But uh, no, no, it has a certain uh, uh, enticement. It has a certain opportunity for people to fall into the music um, structure. Uh, which allows expression and excitement and uh, uh, opportunity to uh, feel life. You made the comment, I think, when we were at McCartney, that it, you understood because it was a sense of community. It is. The 25,000 people or whatever, oh, yes. Yes. all on the same page. In fact, I couldn't imagine the first time I saw this happen. They all came together as a community yeah. to participate in that particular entertainment. And before we come to a, a few things, you were kind enough to come to uh, a retirement evening they had for me at the University of Pennsylvania in Wharton. Uh, any thoughts or reactions seeing your student or seeing that evening? Yes, that is the most profound uh, statement we could talk about today. And that is the opportunity to be an educator uh, in your heart, whether it's uh, uh, music or psychology, I'm thinking of the two grandchildren, uh, but, or whether it's economics. And uh, that's a satisfying thing. Um, I must tell you that Peter Linneman was uh, an individual coming to Ashland University who was uh, unfamiliar with the operations of higher ed. And um, as I saw him start to uh, think and produce within the uh, uh, system of uh, education, I became very intrigued with how far and what he could do. And um, I remember all kinds of experiences. Uh, one I will end up though with saying, Peter, I want you to go to the University of Chicago and I want you to get that PhD and keep going. And that he did. And uh, then on to Wharton and then on, excitingly enough, to what I consider one of the fundamentals and that is entrepreneurship. Unless we have that in our country, which he exemplifies, uh, we will not progress. So let me come back to what probably, you talked about the girls transitioning, well, probably what a lot of people my age <laughs> wrestle with is what will it be like to age, to, to, to become quote old, as the vernacular would be. And in the last 10 years, you've gone 
to an age that used to be very unusual. Today it's not as unusual, but it's still noteworthy. Um, how do you deal, how have you dealt with you keep going on while loved ones, friends, associates don't? Either they pass away or their brain or body leaves them. How have you coped with that? That's very difficult because you uh, lose more and more friends, of course, and more and more acquaintances. I think the uh, one of your first questions on being marginalized um, and I don't think that's quite the right word, but I think the word is that you change roles and the roles that you play and you come to my age now and I think of my role as one of being supportive. And that of being supportive is different than uh, being the lead of the pack. It has to do with looking ahead to the future uh, of the country or the activity. and. Um, so I caution you when you get my age, continue to move forward as the uh, opportunities and live life. When, when I'm at your age, we'll be doing a 30 year update of this of you. <laughs> I, I have no doubt of that. Oh boy. <laughs> One of the things that happened in that intervening time is you had a very serious uh, battle with cancer. Yes. Um, two questions. Um, did it deep down frighten you? No, it didn't it frighten me, surprisingly enough. I did, uh, before the colon cancer surgery, sit down and say to myself, what have I not done that I'd like to get done? And that was the support of the truly disadvantaged of the world. And uh, so I did that. And I guess the thing that uh, happens is that your perspective becomes both past, present, and future. And so long as you do that, you're fine. And did you, my second question is, did you surprise yourself in how effectively you came through it? I, um, that's a good question. I'm still deciding whether I've done that successfully. <laughs> well, I guess my question implies that you have. So <laughs> Why did I do it? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Um, and I think some of that is a struggle. Uh, life is meant to be, and this is a hard lesson, but life is not meant to be one simple thread of happiness and glory. There is pain in it, there is agony, there is hope, there is promise, there is love, and there is opportunity if we make it. So, um, a broad question. What have you learned about the world, if anything, in the last 10 years or so that you didn't know, good or bad? Well, the one that uh, I've learned, I knew there was goodness in the world, but I've been in, intrigued with the depth of the goodness. When you think of um, what a given group of people can do for the good of the world, uh, or their own world, which is just their own family, uh, what can happen. So, and yet, <laughs> I've also come to consider that the value of the dollar, meaning the possession of the dollar, uh, is far more important than it should be, because it can be the negative rather than the positive. If it is the positive, it is glorious. If that becomes the negative, meaning exploitation of people, exploitation of yourself, exploitation of the future. So I guess I'm pleading for a DNA that each person builds themselves and they build it so that they are aware of what's happening. And if they then live by that DNA that they built, good. But if they start out and this wanders and they don't know where they want to be and what they want to do. And I don't mean job, I mean the personhood. So I'm encouraged to suggest that we all need to define our own DNA and then live by it with faith. And don't forget, if you don't have a foundation, it's tough going. So let me, what did you learn, if anything, about yourself over the last decade that may have surprised you or enriched you? 
I'm far too sensitive, and I know that uh, it hasn't uh, gone away. I'd like to say that, oh, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters to me. I, I, it shouldn't. Um, what have I learned about myself? I've learned that uh, when things go wrong, I try to blame myself rather than somebody else. That sounds like a simple statement, but if I do that, it helps rather than saying, oh, you're, you know, whatever. Uh, that's not meant to be a, a fun answer. That's meant to be one that says, what can I do to make things better the next time? Uh, rather than, oh, he's wrong or she's wrong or, no, what can you do? So I guess I've learned to uh, look at the bright side of life rather than the opportunity. In other words, hope. Hope Actually, and, that was, yeah. we also saw Monty Python's Holy Grail. You may remember the song, <laughs> Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. We saw that in the last decade. And, yeah, and, yeah. And so, That's it. That's um, it. You what, remember. What um, keeps you going at age 95 or 92, whenever you were in that decade, but let's say 95, that you saw others as they age didn't have or don't do? What keeps you going? Well, I think the um, opportunity for being cared for is beautiful, uh, but I think too many people uh, think it is the best thing to do and they begin to acquiesce, uh, perhaps intentionally or unintentionally, and they lose their own drive, their own individual. You must stay who you are uh, if you uh, are going to survive. Just decide who you are and then live that life. So but when you me, give up, it's too bad. So let me ask in that regard, a very broad question, not just about the last 10 years. As you sit here, do you have any real regrets? Um, maybe they're trivial, maybe they're deep. I have a couple very trivial ones. No, they're not trivial, but they're very deep to me. I had a great, great friend uh, who was ill and um, uh, then he was released from his uh, uh, medical uh, confinement sent to a retirement center and called and said could you come up and and see me I'd, I'd like to visit with you and I said well it's Wednesday do you object if I wait till Saturday when I have all the day because he wanted to see me and he died and I did not go on Wednesday I was going on Saturday and to this day, I can't stand the fact that I didn't get in the car and go. And yet, you know, it would have made no difference. And yet. It, it made a difference to me. I understand. Yes. Um, uh, this is a bit of a trivial question, but I'm curious of the answer. Do you really, do you want to live to be 100? Oh, yes. My aunt lived to be 103, and I'm shooting for her. And if I can't beat uh, the earlier generation, there's something wrong with this generation. <laughs> um, just a couple of more. Um, you've, we've used, as we've spoken over the years, the phrase love and good, and the power of love and good. And why don't you just comment on that concept as you see it? Well, the thing I really learned through uh, life is uh, sum up in this area, and that is that what life is really about is it's very simple, and that's love and being loved, giving love and receiving love, and being productive. So what, do it, what does that mean? That means that it's the interrelationship of human beings, one to the other, with a sensitivity of reality and focus for their well-being, your well-being, the composition of the whole that makes life what it is. So I'm going to give you, only because you're 95, um, one question. If Is there anything you'd like to ask me that you don't have to, but is I'm actually going to allow you. You wanted to do it last time and I didn't let you. So I'll let you since you're 95 if, if there's one. one thing, just only one? Just one. Um, Peter, um, how do you keep yourself, what I call, grounded with the enormous travel that you must do? Your days away 
are more than 50%? Probably 40%. 40, I was going to call it 50, but 40%. Away from your base, wherever your base is, which happens to be Philadelphia. Right. But uh, how do you keep that in perspective with your life as a whole? I, I made it part of my life, truly made it part of my life, and, and as opposed to something I do. Mm -hmm. Most people do a vacation, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. or they do a trip. I, it, this is just my life, and I adjusted to that, and, uh, and I have the luxury of traveling quite comfortably, which makes the travel much easier. And I have the luxury of traveling with some very wonderful people. You have been a travel partner on many of those, which makes it fun and enjoyable and a great learning experience. And other people you know I travel with, and I visit uh, the kids in Germany, which that's a wonderful experience. Yes, I'm away, but it's a great experience. So I think the real point is, yes, I travel a lot, um, but by integrating it to just be, it is what I do. And, and yes, some of it's for fun, and yes, some of it's for, a lot of it's for work, and some is for both. Uh, otherwise, you just get ground, just ground down by it. And I think the problem most people have with travel is it is not part of their life, and if you do something that's not part of your life, it's unbalancing, whereas for me, it's, not unbalancing, if that makes sense. All right, so I just want the record to show I let you ask one question. Well, to, I appreciate the answer because I think it's fundamental. <laughs> um, okay, so now I have two questions I would like to wrap up with. Um, one is the classic question, is there anything I should have asked you and have not? Or is there anything you'd like to say um, as we wrap up? And then I have one other question. Well, the only one I think of is, uh, where would I like to go that I haven't been? Well, that was my last question. Oh, well and then I we, will show it over the shoulder. Only In because fact, we my were last talking question about is so the way I ended last session. Okay. Which was, so is there any place that you would still like to go? Yes, I'll tell you, this may be strange to you, but I have longed to see the northeastern part of the United States when the leaves are turning in the fall, which is like October, or I'm not sure where it is, but right when the leaves, I have never been able to see those leaves that are classic in the United States history uh, of beauty as the leaves turn into the fall well, and the colors develop. That's easier to arrange than Antarctica was. <laughs> yeah, that so is I think easier. <laughs> when we come back 10 years from now, you'll and be able to report you got to see it. <laughs> Lucille Ford, Amen. Lucille Garber Ford, thank you very much for taking this thank time, you for the time and sharing with generations. We appreciate all you've done over your life for everybody in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. It was all right. fun as, it always. Was, as always. Love you, love you, love, love you. you.